Uh, you can turn to 2 Corinthians uh, 9, if you would, please. Uh, David Kriego did the, the offering introduction tonight. <clears throat> Let's see, uh, uh, not last night, but a week before, I was out of town with the ensemble, and I thought, who could lead my song for Saturday night men's prayer? And I thought, Dave Kriego. So I pulled out my trusty cell phone and said, hey, Dave, can you uh, lead the song for Saturday night? Saturday Night Men's Prayer, and that was new for him, so he, normal questions, he kind of responded, texted back, oh, will I, will, will I pick that song, or, or will you give me a song? And I said, well, there's a pretty familiar song, you can, you can just pick the song, and he's like, well, uh, and then just, just grab a hymnal, yeah, just the college chapel, you can just find something in there, and, and pick a familiar song, and lead it, and you should be fine, and then I looked down and noticed that I'm not texting David Kriego. Uh, I was texting the wrong Dave. Uh, I'm like, DJ, that's not Dave Kriego. Who's Dave? Oh, Brother, John, D- Brother Dave Johnson. <laughs> and so I was just imagining, I caught him later. I'm like, Brother, I was texting the wrong Dave. And, and, and he said, oh. <laughs> I thought, boy, is everyone gone? But I said... <laughs> I said, but I said, brother, I commend you for that willingness. I, uh, <laughs> he, he was ready to go. Uh, we have a lot of willing people here, and I thank you. It's a blessing. Uh, even even uh, years ago when I first started doing hospital visitation, I would find many times when I, when I would race over there to, to visit somebody, somebody in this church had already been there. Uh, checking on them, praying with them. And I thought, boy, as, as an assistant pastor, it's hard to keep up with our folks sometimes. The, the willingness, where there's a, there's a thoughtfulness. Uh, and I appreciate that. <clears throat> uh, and Brother, you know, Brother Johnson, again, that was, he, was, he was willing, and there's a willing spirit here. And really, uh, we sang the, so- the song, Thank You, Lord, for giving to me, Right? When you are consumed with the fact that, well, he gave me so much. He gave me so much. When you you focus on that, you can't help but think, I've got to be giving somewhere. I've got to be giving uh, back because it just matches the one I'm in love with, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, So tonight, three weeks, I've been your pastor for three weeks, so it's time to preach on giving. (laughs) <laughs> so I've got a lot to preach on. I've got a lot of subjects I'll need to hit. Um, so I thought, well, let's get this one out of the road and let's preach on giving. Uh, I, I, love, uh, I love giving, uh, but let's go through some ideas uh, tonight and uh, let's ask the Lord to stir our hearts. All right, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, but this I say, he which soweth uh, sparingly shall reap also sparingly. Uh, He that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Boy, it would be the foolish farmer, wouldn't it? Uh, Lord, uh, I'm praying for a good crop, and if you come through next year, maybe I'll start sowing. Maybe I'll throw some seed out on my land. Uh, Next year, if you'll give me a... And you say, Mr. Farmer, you have it backwards. You're going to have to sow... And then trust God for the increase. Uh, you, can't, you can't wait. You have that backwards. Uh, as we sow sparingly, we'll re- reap also sparingly. But if we'll sow bountifully, we'll reap also bountifully. And really, it's God's grace that enables. God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That ye always having all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work. Let's pray. 
Lord, thank you for Fairhaven. Thank you for the willingness that, that I just see here, Lord, the people that, that, that want to, to be a part of things, Lord. And really, isn't, it, it's not because we're a bunch of good folks. It's because you've done a work on us. It's you, God. It's you. You've changed people. You've turned us into something better than we would have been. We thank you. We owe you so much. Thank you for what you've allowed us to have in this place. Lord, as I look at this, this precious subject of giving, we remember that uh, you are the, uh, you're the pattern anyway. There in John 3.16, uh, God, you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son. I pray that you bless uh, these truths from your word tonight and, and, and work on hearts. Lord, this, this area is an important area. It gives a peek into where we are spiritually. I pray, Lord, that each one of us would take a good look inside and uh, let you work on us. I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so I want to address three groups of people here tonight. Uh, the uncommitted. Um, and, and maybe you're just, maybe you're a young person. Uh, you, you've got it, and you've never really committed to tithing. You've never really understood maybe some teaching on tithing. Um, the, but, but again, if, if you, you, you're, you're, you're a member here, God's given you a, a, a job. Tithing is an important part of obedience. So uh, if you're uncommitted in this area, you've never taken steps of faith to begin tithing, I want to, uh, uh, I want to preach to you, preach for you, preach at you some, <laughs> and I want to talk to the uncommitted some. Uh, secondly, I want to talk to the uncertain, the uncertain. Uh, those of you maybe that were committed at one point to giving uh, what you should have in the past, but maybe some uncertainty has entered your life and you've done some scaling back to some degree. Uh, you are uncertain in some area and your giving matches your uncertainty. I want to speak to you. I want to, uh, you say, well, if my uncertainty goes away, then I'll give. And it might be that if you give, a lot of that uncertainty in your life would go away. Uh, then thirdly, I'd like to speak to the undeterred. The undeterred. A while ago you said, this is what God wants and I'm going to do it till I die. And uh, I just, I, I, I thank the Lord for that. You understand the importance of biblical giving and haven't faltered in it, but as an ongoing examination of where we are, I'd ask you also to look inside. Lord, where am I? It's something we constantly have to do. But giving is important. Um, it, th those, well, you, you all have stopped by the gas pump <laughs> recently. Um, and uh, you think, what world am I living in? Uh, boy, but, but to run, run our buses, to run those vans, uh, it's going to take, uh, so giving, it, it, it limits or uh, allows what we're able to do as a church. It, we, we mentioned this, it gives us a sneak peek at our hearts where we are. Uh, some people, uh, the, it's, money is not the root of all evil, it's the love of of money that's the root of all evil. It tells us that in 1 Timothy 6.10. Uh, money is an important gauge of, uh, we want to be a channel of blessing, and God allows money to flow through our possession. And with it, he does a lot of shaping in our lives. So first of all, let's talk to the uncommitted. The uncommitted. Uh, you think, I've never really stepped out by faith in this area of tithing, and maybe it's I've never had somebody Explain it to me uh, very well. So let's, let's start looking at this a little bit. Uh, Christians and tithing. Boy, Abraham and Jacob tithed 500 years before the law was even instituted. It, it was happening before the law. Uh, Moses and Malachi and Jesus spoke of tithing during the time period of the law. And the Apostle Paul explained tithing after the law. Uh, Christians should tithe. And so how did these men promote it? Um, well, Abraham kind of commenced it in, in many ways. Um, there, as far as some of the biblical record, there, Genesis uh, 14. Uh, uh, Genesis, uh, let, me, let me go there. So in Genesis 14, uh, I would almost like to read the whole chapter, but I won't. It's an exciting chapter. Young men love this chapter. Um, I, and I categorized myself as a young man. Did you notice that? 
Um, so there in the beginning of, of Genesis 14, um, it, these really fun names, uh, and it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of um, Lesar, Ketaleomar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations. Tidal. It's like a tidal wave. Seems like a, he should be, you know, a wrestler or something. No, coming Tidal. Um, Tidal, king of nations. These made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Ashinab, king of Admon, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. And so, um, and the, 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 the one group of kings were, uh, had, had the other group of kings under tribute. Twelve years, verse 4, they served Kedileomar. In the 13th year, they, they rebelled. And in the 14th year, Kedileomar and his coalition of kings came in and conquered them. Well, in that mix was Lot. Lot and his family was captured. And so, again, this amazing story, Abraham throws together his servants and goes and defeats this coalition, which is unbelievable. 318 servants. He goes out there. He splits them into three parts. He, he, he does business. Uh, and he defeats them. He brings the, the people back. He brings the spoils of war back. Now he's got, he's got all these people. He has the chance to maybe get big-headed. He's got all this money. And uh, it's kind of interesting. We get down to uh, verse 17. And it's almost like right in the middle of, of, of the king, what the king of Sodom is trying to do here. We have the story of Mel Melchizedek right there in verse 18. And it's almost, it almost interrupts the whole story of Sodom. The king of Sodom there in 17. And then we have 18 Melchizedek. Um, and then we get back to Sodom on verse 21. So it's almost like it interrupts something here. Verse 17, the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kittleomar and the kings that were with him in the valley of uh, um, Sheva, Shevi, which is the king's dale, and Melchizedek. Kind of completely interrupting things right here. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, grape juice, and he was the priest of the most high God, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And then we get right back to Sodom. This is, this is a very interesting passage, but it's almost like God interrupts what's, what, what's going on with Sodom in order to prepare Abraham for his engagement with the king of Sodom here in verse 21. So he pays these tithes, and then the king of Sodom comes up, verse 21. The king of Sodom says to Abraham, or Abram, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. So uh, let me have the souls, and you can keep the spoil uh, in exchange. Um, and now Abr Abram's thinking, boy, I, I have this money that I, I could take, and uh, he was prepared to make the right choice. A lot of times money enters our lives and, and we're not ready for it. It changes too much of our thinking. It comes in, maybe a, we're not thinking straight, well, I'm going to do this. Um, but, but then money comes in in some way and, it, and we find ourselves doing something. We, we thought, I never would have done that. I wasn't prepared for the thinking. Well, Abraham was, Abram was prepared for the thinking in verse 22. So the, the king of Sodom says, you take the money, I'll take the souls. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Most people don't care how they become rich. But he was prepared to say, if I'm going to be blessed, it's going to come the right way. Amen. If I'm going to be blessed, it's going to be because God blessed me. How was he prepared for that? Well, I think he spent a little time with Melchizedek, worshiping, and he shaved off that tithe and gave it. I really believe, I, I, I've been there uh, <laughs> where covetousness starts to set in and you're like oh if I and then I could ooh, and if I and I find that I'm consumed with with thoughts about how can I make another buck at, at times of my life and it's like Lord I don't like this feeling I don't like this I can become consumed with my how can I make another buck and I'm not thinking about other things and I found through the years just to take a little bit extra money and drop it in the offering plate is like a medicine 
It cure, it, it releases the hold that money can have on me. And right here, I think God used this opportunity. Right in the middle of Sodom comes up and boom, there's Melchizedek. Let's talk, let's worship, let's give. And because of that, oh, there was a blessed release. Then the next couple of verses he says, uh, I'm not interested in, this, in these riches. You take the souls and you take the spoils back. I'm not letting anyone say that you made me rich. If I'm going to be blessed, God is going to have to do it. And we, I know we all like the idea, but it, it takes constant vigilance to ask God, help me to have the right relationship with money. It's so easy for it to start to consume my thoughts, consume my mind. So Abraham commenced it, uh, and then uh, Jacob continued it. Jacob continued it there in Genesis 28. And he kind of does an if-then thing. Uh, probably a lot of you remember reading this and think, hey, wait, wait a minute, Jacob, I don't like your tone here. All this if-then. God, if you'll do this then, and it really should be I'm going to do this and trust you. And so you, we kind of see some if-then here in Genesis 28, verses 20 and 22. So uh, Abraham commenced it. Uh, in, in some ways there was tithing before Abraham, but, but, but Jacob continued it. Uh, Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way uh, that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I will come again to my father's house, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth. So tithe actually means tenth. I will surely give the tenth unto thee. If you're still there in Genesis, turn over to Genesis uh, 33 real fast. Um, we, had, we heard a message uh, Thursday night on the emptiness of Esau, and it made me think of this passage here in Genesis 33. Years ago, I saw this. Um, I remember driving behind someone uh, years ago, and, I, and it scared me. I saw a bumper sticker on the back of their car that said, doing fine without a God. And really, that's, that's the kind of life that Esau lived. Um, look at what Esau, so we, we know the story here in, in Genesis 33. We know the story that uh, Jacob found out that Esau is coming, and Esau, uh, uh, Jacob wants to bribe his brother <laughs> into not slaughtering him, and so he sends this large gift, and Esau looks at the gift, and it's interesting, um, uh, verse 8, Genesis 33, verse 8, he says, uh, what meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, well, these are to find grace in the sight of my Lord, and Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast unto thyself. I have enough. And you might say, what a solid guy. He's so content. <laughs> but really, it's the, it's the same as that bumper sticker. I have enough without God. I'm fine. And God isn't a part of anything. And I'm still doing fine. Now, Jacob uses the exact same words uh, two verses later. But he has enough Instead of without God, he has enough because of God. Listen to this. Verse 9, Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast unto thyself. And Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at thy hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God and thou was pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee because God hath dealt graciously with me and because, you see the words there? I have enough. You'd say, wow, two content guys. One was sinfully content. And one was spiritually content. I have enough, and God is not a part of it. I have enough because God is a part of it. And we saw there in, in Hebrews 12, uh, Esau, like, what a content guy. Is that why he sought bitterly? bitterly with tears the things that he was missing in life that later on became important to him that doesn't seem very content to me that sounds empty I have enough and I don't even need God I can say that yeah you can say that it's foolish to say that because everything you have is because God's been gracious to you whether Amen. you want to admit it or not Amen. I have enough without God 
Oh, Jacob, boy, he said, I have enough because of God. Boy, Jacob continued it. Moses confirmed it there in Leviticus 27, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Oh, man. Uh, does money buy happiness? Does money buy happiness? Can you think of a court battle we, we just watched? Uh, uh, no, I didn't, I didn't watch any of it. But I'm uh, semi-aware semi in the news <laughs> of a court battle of a husband going after his wife, some sort of defamation. I don't, I don't even know the situation. But they're, they've got a lot of money there. A lot of money. Boy, does money buy happiness? Now they say in, in a lot of marriages, money issues tear marriages apart. Oh, if we had more money, our marriage would be better. Is that the answer? Is, is that what we see when you, <laughs> when you check out of the checkout line? And if, and if you can, if you can, oh, my, what's, oh, no. Uh, he's, he's, he's getting rid of that wife, and they're in, in battle. They're, they're, in, they're in custody, or they're, they're in court cases. And, oh, that, that rich, super rich guy, he's divorcing that wife. And this is, does money buy happiness? I'm excited for Cooper and Sabrina. Uh, uh, boy, they... They have this marriage, and I, and I don't know, Brother Cooper, if you're ever going to be super rich. God could do it, but uh, boy, the two of them, they have the Lord, they have each other. I like to go home, and when my wife hands me a, a meal, and I'm like, I doubt Warren Buffett is enjoying his dinner any more than I am. In fact, I suspect I'm enjoying my dinner a lot more than a lot of those rich guys, because there's a whole lot of biblical love baked into this meal. I love it. <laughs> oh, man, God is, so a lot of times, a lot of times you have those couples that say, hey, hon, remember when we didn't have squat, but God took care of us? Do you remember? Oh, we, we had to look to him. Good times. Good times. Boy, money is not the, your attitude, your relationship with money is what's important. Not having, if I just had more. Oh, a lot of times if you had more, that gets you in more trouble. Moses confirmed it. Malachi commanded it. There in Malachi 3, 8 through 10, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me. Even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be, may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. God likes to be proved. God likes to be tested. I wonder if I can step out by faith and test him. Uh, you, you, you probably all remember the, the illustration, right, of the, the guy that was walking across the, the tightrope and he could walk across the tightrope and he could come back and the crowd's like, Yay! and he could put a, a wheelbarrow on the tightrope, doubtless some sort of special wheel on there that could, and he could go across, he could put some bricks in the, in the wheelbarrow, right? And he can go across and they're like, Yay! and uh, how many of you believe that I could put one of you in my wheelbarrow and go across the tightrope? We all do. <laughs> okay, who's going to get in? <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> Oh, uh, boy. I, so, so God, he comes by. Like, oh, Lord, I love the stories in the Bible. Lord, I love this. I lo oh, you're wonderful. And, and he says, okay, who's going to get in? <laughs> and I'm not saying, you know, it's, uh, that's what faith is. You're like, hmm. <laughs> that's not for me. But, boy, God says, prove me. I got my wheelbarrow here. Will, will you get in? Will you get in? Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there be not room enough to receive it. Isn't that something? Oh, I think I'll, I might, we, we did it just the other day. You know, you, right? You, you put something under, under the, the faucet to fill it up and it's filling up slowly enough that you think, while that's filling, I can go do this. And then you forget that that's filling. Uh, I think we just did that yesterday. 
with the lemonade. And it was like, oh, he was cleaning, cleaning all that up. But that overflowing, there wasn't room in that bucket to receive how much water was going in to mix with the lemonade powder or whatever it was. Wouldn't that be fun if your life, so many blessings going in, there's not room enough to receive it, and it's spilling out to those around you? What a blessing there. What a blessing. Um, so my, my niece had a birthday Friday night. Boy, my, my kids, you know, they get their little birthday cards, right? You get, a, you get a dollar in your birthday card, adjusted for inflation now. What would that be? $1,213 in your, in your birthday card. So you get that dollar, and we, t- we, t- we teach those little guys, hey, make, make sure a dime of that goes to the Lord. Make sure a dime of that goes to the Lord. Does God need those dimes out of every dollar? He doesn't need our dimes, but we need his blessing on our church, and we're not going to get his blessing if we're not going to be obedient. Everyone in this church, the tithe, it goes to the Lord. We cannot be God robbers. That wind, the windows of heaven that are open to us. And then verse 11 he says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he will not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> I believe this. <laughs> I believe this. Everyone tithes. Everyone tithes. It's just not where you want it to go sometimes. God's going to get his tithe. Just like when the children of Israel quit giving that, that Sabbath year and they went off into captivity. God got his year, didn't he? Those things added up. You, you're going to tithe to the doctor. And by the way, if you went to the doctor this week, I'm not saying, oh, okay, all right. No, no, I'm not saying that. But God, you're going to tithe to that doctor. You're going to tithe to that repairman. You're going to tithe. Just like Dr. Vogan preached a few weeks back, um, boy, the fellowship of his sufferings. We're going to suffer and if we're going to suffer anyway, there's suffering in this life. If you're going to suffer anyway, I want to do it with Jesus. I want the fellowship of his sufferings. If I'm going to suffer anyway, I want to suffer with Jesus, for Jesus, because of Jesus. I want to have the fellowship of his sufferings. If you're going to tithe anyway, might as well be obedient and enjoy the windows of heaven being opened in your life. Uh, Jesus commended it. Uh, in the New Testament there, Matthew 23, 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye, ta- ye, ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done. And so he says, uh, you tithe, you, you did right. That's exactly what you should have done. There's other things that you forgot, but that you did and that's what, exactly what you should have done. You should be careful in this area of tithing. We want to be careful. In fact, I, I have to remind myself with, with little things. I'm like, hey, Lord, you dropped this little lump. And sometimes I'll forget to take a, a bit of that and give it back to the Lord. And so I have reminders in my life. Uh, make sure, uh, did, did God drop any blessings in your life? Don't forget to tithe on it. I have my computer electronically. Hey, don't forget. Be careful. Be careful. I don't want God to say, ah, I tried. <laughs> I want him to keep trying. <laughs> so I want to be careful when he drops those blessings in. <clears throat> Boy, o- o- obedience. God blesses obedience. I-, I'm- I started into Judges this morning in my Bible reading. And how sad that uh, when they were disobedient, they would be powerless before their enemies. Do you want to live a life powerless before your enemies? Just go through life powerless before your enemies? Well, just keep disobeying. But when you, have, when you have obedience, when you turn to God, you have power, and that's a much more exciting life. There in the beginning of Judges, there's that thumbless guy. Do you remember the thumbless guy? Adonai Bezek. So Judges chapter 1, Adonai Bezek. The Bible says they captured Adonai Bezek and cut his thumbs off and his big toes. Um, and you're like, oh. <laughs> um, so, and, 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 and he had done that to 70 other kings, three score and 10 kings. He said, three score and 10 kings that I capture, I cut their thumbs off, I cut their big toes off, and they just, they just ate scraps from under my table. Oh. Ladies, that's awful, but 
But for a man, oh, that's awful. You're down there just picking up scraps. Um, he, he, again, he, he left them alive and mutilated them in that way so that they would be powerless and humiliated. They couldn't run. They couldn't, they couldn't hold a sword anymore. And they're, just, and they're just gathering scraps. And I thought, boy, disobedience cuts our thumbs off. You go through life gathering scraps, and boy, life is hard. Yeah, well, disobedience cuts your thumbs off, cuts your toes off. It's awful. It's awful. You want to live that life? Well, God will give you your thumbs back. God is merciful. He's wonderful. You can say, Lord, I'm ready to start obeying. I want to, in this area of giving, in this area of service, Lord, until I die, I want to be doing all I can for your honor and glory. Lord, search me. Look at my heart. Try my thoughts. Am I where I need to be in this area? So Jesus commended it, and, and God commissioned it there in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 and 14. Uh, Do ye not know uh, that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? And so uh, this is reaching back into the Old Testament, how God provided for the worship system in the Old Testament. And then verse 14 takes those Old Testament principles and draws them back, in, uh, draws them into the New Testament, verse 14. Even so hath the Lord ordained, hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Tithes and offerings are meant for the support, upkeep, and ministry of your church. And then Paul conformed it, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Upon the first day of the week, that Sunday, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So we have tithes and offerings. And if... Don't get cute with the way you run your numbers. <laughs> Ananias and Sapphira, uh, Acts chapter 5, right? They say, oh, don't get cute with God. Just simply do what he wants in those, in those areas of giving. Um, so tithe, that's that taking that 10% and, and do it right away. Don't set it aside and say, well, we'll see if, if, if my money lasts through the month and I have to dip into that tithe. No, just give it. So there's no temptation. Of, it's his. It's his. You can't ask God for a blessing if you take what's his. Um, shave that right off. And then offering. So tithes and offerings. Offering is above and beyond the tithe. So in other words, when there's an other's offering here, you don't take a chunk out of your tithe and call it your other's offering. In December, oh, look at that number in the back. It's exciting. And we want to get up to that, whatever, 25,000 or whatever it is. We're, we're trying to go for this goal, right? And we see that, and like, oh, I'm going to take a chunk out of my tithe and throw that on there. No, that's not how that works. Don't take your tithe money in December and call it your Christmas offering. Uh, in the Old Testament, it was, it was it, obviously there was love for the Lord, but, but there was uh, motivation from the law, to give. And the New Testament motivation should be more love to give. We love him because he first loved us and he loved us so much that he gave. And I want to be giving back like I should. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Where should our tithes be brought? Uh, well, in the Old Testament, uh, it was brought to the temple. Malachi 3, 10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. In the New Testament, uh, there in the end of Acts, chapter 4, um, they were laying their tithes at the apostles' feet, and that's when Barnabas, he, uh, he, he, laid, uh, he, he sacrificed, and that's when Ananias and Sapphira, they said, ooh, look at the notoriety he's receiving. We want that. And they approached it with the wrong heart, got creative um, in the wrong way. Uh, and then in the beginning of Acts, chapter 5, uh, and they kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And pretty soon the two of them had been carted off to be buried. 
So they were bringing it to the apostles, um, but then we, we bring it to the church. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 2, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. It is God's plan for you to give your tithe where you are a church member. Okay? Not, uh, not to the tele-evangelist <laughs> that you're like, man, that's pretty good. He'll send me a prayer, uh, a prayer blankie if I, if I send this off to him. And I really, I really want that, pl- that prayer blankie. That's, that's hard to say. A prayer blankie. All right. So that was number one. To the uncommitted. These other ones aren't as long. Next, to the uncertain. To the uncertain. Maybe you gave at one point like you should have, but you've scaled some things back. I've been there. I've been there where this is what God wants me to give. And you start to rethink some things. Covetous, covetous starts, to, starts to eke its way in. And, and you start to, mm, you know, God will be fine with. Have you all been there too? Just me? The uncertain. Have you scaled back? Let's get back at it. It's right. We want God's blessing on this place. I want God's blessing in your home. Let's get back at it. Don't even think about it. Uh, Shave off that 10% and give it to God. Just get it done. And then trust God to help you with the bills. Don't do it backwards. Don't don't set it aside and we'll say, well, Lord, if if you'll help me make it to the end of the month, I will drop this tithe in. Don't do that backwards. Don't do it. It just plays with your mind. Take care of the Lord. Doesn't the Bible say in Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you? I love, there's a story I tell, I'll I'll tell it to you kind of quickly, but I love this little story. There was this little boy who, uh, um, he he lived in the city and then grandma and grandpa lived a couple hours uh, out of town uh, in, in the country. And, and the, the, the boy had spent uh, the summer with grandma and grandpa. And this is a long time ago when money went further. He had $9 toward his pair of roller skates. And he needed one more dollar, $10, to buy the pair of roller skates that he desperately wanted. So he was there with grandma and grandpa. He was earning little bits of, uh, of money and, and he had gotten up to $9. It had taken him a little while and he's thinking, oh, I just have that one more dollar and I can buy a pair of roller skates. Well, it came time. The summer was over. Uh, Mom and dad were going to come pick him up and take him back to town so he could start the school year. And just as he was walking out the door, grandpa says, hey, come on over here. So he comes over. Yes, grandpa. And he says, I know how much you love to give in Sunday school. So here's a quarter. You can drop that in the offering plate when you get back. And I want to give another quarter to you to go toward your roller skate fund. Grandpa, thank you. And so grandpa, boy, he was kind of, uh, you know how grandpas can be silly sometimes. It's part of their job description. And so he says, make sure you put them in separate pockets so you don't get them mixed up. And you're like, how hard would it be to put it in one pocket and pull out two quarters and split them? Oh, okay, grandpa. Okay, with a twinkle in his eye. So one on this side, one on this side, good to go. He heads out the door, jumps in the car, tells mom and dad all the stories. It was wonderful we had, you know, t- about the whole summer. Gets back to the town. Uh, and then he goes into his house, unpacks, and then, oh, he wants to dig out that money. He reaches in one pocket. He pulls out the quarter. He reaches in the other pocket and finds a hole in the bottom of his pocket. <laughs> There's a quarter missing. But now the question, whose quarter is missing? Was, is it God's quarter that's missing? Or is it my quarter that's missing? And then practically speaking, he doesn't know where the quarter is, but God does, right? There you go. God, wherever your quarter ended up. <laughs> I pray that it would serve you mightily. Well, and, and then the Bible isn't clear, right? The Bible is not clear. There's no passage when thy grandpa giveth thee two quarters and you find that one is missing, thou shalt. There's no verse. And so he's like, what do I do? He went to Sunday school, 
and he's thinking, oh. And the, the teacher taught on Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And he, he knew God was saying, can I have that quarter? Can I have it? He knew God was asking him. And he says, yes. Dropped it in. And you're supposed to get that warm, fuzzy feeling that makes it all better. And he did not. He was like, <laughs> goodbye. Sit says goodbye to that quarter. And to make it worse, his friend right afterwards, you'll never guess what I just got for my birthday. <laughs> I bet you I will. <laughs> the only thing that could possibly make this whole story worse. <laughs> I got roller skates. And aren't you about to get a pair too? Oh, I can't wait. We're going to be riding roller skates together. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. <laughs> so the school year begins and grandma and grandpa come a couple months into the school year uh, to the city to visit. There's Grandma and Grandpa in the house. And it's great to see them. Grandma and Grandpa, hey, it's great to see you. Finally, when the, the family begins to dismiss just a little bit, Grandpa says, hey, come on over here. What is it, Grandpa? He says, that pair of pants that you had that last day you were at my house, do you know where those are? Uh, yes. Why? It's because I suspect you have a hole in one of your pockets. Grandma brought her sewing kit, and she's going to sew that hole closed. And he said, wow, thanks, Grandpa. How did you know? Well, because I watched you put those quarters in your pocket. And when you left, um, I didn't notice it right away, but there was a quarter right there by the, by the front door. And I put two and two together. And, and, and so Grandma brought her sewing kit, and he's thinking, Lord, you took care of me. And so he's like, Grandpa, that's wonderful. Can I have the quarter? And Grandpa's like, well, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> Why not? Grandpa said, well, you know, I, 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 I knew that it was supposed to go to the Lord, assuming that he kept the other quarter. And so I wanted to take care of that for you. I, I went and, and on Sunday, I dropped it uh, in the offering plate for you. And he was like, good, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> yep. Yep. And Grandpa said, what? What's this look on your face? And, he's, and, he, and he, he told Grandpa the story. And of course, as you can imagine, Grandpa's eyes moistened. And he says, uh, Grandma, wait. <laughs> don't, don't, don't sew those pants, that, that, that pocket closed just yet. I, I, let me see that hole. I, I, I think that hole is just the size for a quarter to fall through. I think he, in case he has holes in his pockets in the future, I want to give him a bigger coin. So he pulls out a, a dollar piece, not the Susan B. Anthony size, the ones that are uh, a little bit bigger than a 50 cent piece, those, those ones, uh, a good size. And he says, here, I'll bet you that'll have a harder time falling through the, the hole in the, in the future. Take this. All right, Grandma, go ahead and sew that hole closed. I love that little story. I love that little story. And you say, well, you're just giving me a bunch of uh, tear jerkers. But you know that that's the good way to look at this. We can trust God. And it's an ongoing thing for us to look in, in our hearts and say, Lord, am I doing all that I should? Yes, we have our stewardship time. But really, the entire year, we should be doing stewardship Along the way, Lord, am I doing all that I should? There, and uh, let's go to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. That doesn't count toward my time, does it? That was just a story. Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verses 9 and 10. Here we see that, that tithing is required... But tithing is also rewarded. Tithing is required, but tithing is rewarded. Uh, it says, honor the Lord with thy substance. So Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. And then here's the promise of reward. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now, let's, let's not forget where we are. A lot of people, their life verse is in this chapter, right? Their life verse is trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. 
In this area of giving, make sure you're doing what makes sense to him, not what makes sense to you. We love this verse, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. We love that passage. Oh no, in the context of those verses, it talks about giving. <laughs> I need to ask God what he wants in this area and not be content with what makes sense to me. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Verse 7, be not wise and then in own eyes fear the Lord and depart from evil. You want health and wealth in this life? You want health and wealth in this life? Well, it talks about health there. Verse 8, all the way back to verse 1, my son forget not my law. And then verse 8, it shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. And then we go into this verse. Honor the Lord with thy substance, with the first fruits of all thine increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Boy, it, it doesn't make sense, does it? It seems like 100% of my money would help me go further than 90%. Or you take the tithe and the offering out, whatever that is. But we know the truth, don't we? We know that when you take that, 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 when you give God what's his, that what's left over goes way further. It doesn't make sense, humanly speaking. But we know these verses are true in the same context of trust in the Lord with all thine heart. A few verses later, it says, honor the Lord with the first fruits of thy substance. Someone said giving and stewardship is a wonderful process. It's the area where God allows man to make money, so in the process, God is able to make a man. Tithing is required by God, and tithing is rewarded by God. I, I heard about a man in southern Wales during World War II so he's in southern Wales, and he has this little automotive shop. And during World War II, all of the private vehicles had been commandeered, and things became so expensive, his little automobile shop was going to go out of business. It had gone through times of depression. It had gone through all sorts of things. Um, but, but he was, he was out, and, and during the good times, he was always generous. Boy, he made sure he gave to God. He also made sure when missionaries came through, they, they knew they could stop by and get their engine tuned up, get, get a meal at his table, uh, even, even get some gasoline for their car, but now things were tight. He was laying off his employees and saying, Lord, I, my, my business is going to go bankrupt. You have to help me. Well, uh, a, a man walked in and said, uh, if I can get you the parts... Would you be able to rebore and rebuild an engine for me? Oh, sure, he replied. And soon the job was done. The man paid for the job and left. And he didn't hear anything from him for about a week. After the week was over, the man came back and said, uh, Hey, that was a test. We had tested other people. We would bring them the genuine parts and the engine, and they would swap out those parts for... Uh, uh, inferior black market parts and then keep those good parts to make some money on the side. We wanted to test you to see if you were an honest man. We stripped down the engine that you rebored and rebuilt and everything was just as it should have been. We finally found an honest mechanic. I can keep you just as busy as you can possibly be through the end of the war. God took care of him, didn't he? God takes care of you. There's a promise here. God, tithing is required, but tithing is rewarded as well. You say, I got to save for a rainy day. When my, when my coffers are full, when my rainy day fund is full, then I'll give to God. Well, if you're saving for a rainy day, God can send some, you know, typhoons. Yes, yeah, save for a rainy day, but don't take from God to do it. And then just real quickly, the last thing, the undeterred, the undeterred. Some in here learned a long time ago, I'm not messing with this, I give. And that's a blessing. That's a blessing. 
an ongoing evaluation, though, and I think maybe that's, that's why you're undeterred. Maybe you say, Lord, you've been so good to me, and I've never been able to outgive you. I want to keep doing it. There was, a, there was an older man. Um, he, was, he, was a, he was an older man. He had a weak heart. And, uh, and the family received word that he had inherited a million dollars. But he didn't know yet. And the family said, we have to tell Grandpa that he inherited a million dollars, but the excitement could kill him. So we should be careful. And so they, they called up the pastor. They said, Pastor, you're good with people. You're good with words. We need you to break the news because we're just a, a afraid for Grandpa. So the pastor's like, understood. So the pastor comes in and says, Grandpa, he, he decided the indirect approach would be best. Grandpa, what would you do if eh, you found out that you had inherited a million dollars? He said, well, preacher, I, I'd, I'd give it to the church. And don't you know the pastor had a heart attack? <laughs> I've, I've been there where uh, it seems like years and years I'm thinking yes stewardship time uh, as we get closer to that time and you think I'm exactly where I need to be the preaching won't touch me this year and I'm wrong every single time the preaching gets going my heart is stirred Lord I, I've, I've cooled off in some areas thank you for sending the preaching I need it I want to be giving like I should. Um, you know, the Bible teaches us that our heart follows our treasure, doesn't it? Our heart follows our treasure. Whatever you invest in, your heart is aimed at. It tells us that, doesn't it? Matthew six nineteen through 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Church family, God wants to take care of this church more than we want it taken care of. Do you believe that? And he's more than capable. We, we need to take a good look. Think, things, are, things are tighter. And that's, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing to say, oh no, I'm at the place where maybe I have to spend some time on my knees. That's not a bad thing, is it? In fact, many ways it's a good thing. Boy, when, when things are, when, when we're at we the smooth sailing, there's lots of money, and we just aren't, we forget to thank God. We forget to ask God for his provision. We're at that place, church family. We're going to say, Lord, we need you. We need you. Let's, let's pray in some more families. I remember praying for the shores. One year, the young couple said, hey, we're praying in a new family this year. We're praying in a new family and we started praying, and then, boom, the shores were in our group. Praise the Lord. They were an answer to prayer. Let's pray in some families. Let's be on our knees. Let's say, Lord, show me what I ought to be doing. With your children, family devotions, kids, let's ask God to take care of our church. Men, Saturday night, prayer, let's be praying, Lord, Please take care of us financially. You've been so good. And we're at a time right now where we can get on our knees and be obedient and watch you take care of us as long as we're obedient in these areas. Let's be obedient and let's watch God work and be careful to thank him for it. Let's uh, stand together.